Uh, welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for May 19th, 2022. I'm Emily Kosky, and I am the vice chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley Warloba. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Chugtai. Present. Council. Member Johnson is absent. Vice Chair Koski. Present. There are four members present. Let the record reflect. We have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. First, we'll go over our consent agenda. There are four items on the consent agenda, which I will read for the record. The first is setting a public hearing for July 14th, 2022, to consider assessments for sidewalk repair and construction. The next is approving the reallocation of funds in the 2022 Capital Improvement Program. Then we have authorizing a master partnership agreement with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And then the next is supporting the West Broadway route alignment for the Blue Line light rail transit extension and submitting City of Minneapolis comments on the route modification report to Hennepin County and Metropolitan County. I'll note that there is a revised resolution uh, related to item number five, so I'll pull that item for further discussion. Is there any discussion on items two through four on the consent agenda, uh, consent agenda, or are there any other items that any would like to pull for further discussion? Not seeing any, I'll move approval for items two through four. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it and the consent agenda is approved. We'll now move on to consent agenda, consent agenda item number five, which was pulled uh, for this further discussion. I'll repeat it again so that we hear it. Uh, supporting the West Broadway route alignment for Blue Line light rail transit, extension and submitting city of Minneapolis comments on the route modification report to Hennepin County and Metropolitan Council. Uh, we have received a revised resolution from Councilmember Ellison, who is not on the committee, but represents the ward most affected by this route change. The revised resolution has been distributed to all committee members. I'll move approval of this resolution to open the floor for discussion. Is there any discussion on this revised resolution? Seeing none, all those uh, in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. All right, we will move on to uh, our public hearing today is considering uh, an ordinance amending the water and sewer code. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, presenting today is Annika Bankston. Annika is the Director of Water Treatment and Distribution. Thank you, Director, Madam Vice Chair, committee members. Uh, again, my name is Annika Bankston, uh, Director of the Division of Water Treatment and Distribution Services. I'm presenting an overview of the proposed revisions to the Code of, code of Ordinances that are uh, cover ordinances that relate to both water treatment and distribution services as well as our surface water and sewer divisions. These proposed ordinance changes uh, repeal and replace a number of chapters in the Code of Ordinances listed here, chapters 505, 507, 509, 510, and 511. The objectives of this ordinance update were really um, twofold. One was to make sure that ordinances were up to date and actually reflected current practices and requirements for our water systems. Uh, the second was upon review, making sure these ordinances are reader friendly, logically organized, and really in plain language that everybody can understand and um, make reference to and understand what we're talking about, quite frankly. Uh, the number of team members worked on these ordinances together, both from the divisions within public works, namely water treatment and distribution services, surface water and sewers. Uh, but we found that items in the ordinances also touched things that related to utility billing, obviously some legal review of different things we were looking at, regulatory services, and the Minneapolis Health Department. So we collaborated with all our partners in those different divisions and departments to make these updates. Uh, the, in particular, the ordinances relating to water really required extensive editing and reorganization of three chapters. 
Uh, and upon working with the city clerk, they actually recommended a full repeal and replace of those chapters rather than proceeding with a very complicated red line underscoring strike through that was made it really difficult to understand the changes being made. So those, or, those chapters are proposed to be repealed and replaced. For surface water and sewers, um, Back in 2018, Chapter 510 for stormwater and Chapter 511 for sanitary sewers were actually added to the ordinances. Uh, this, these additions set the stage for some updates to Chapter 509 that we needed to make as part of these updates. And then also in 2022 with these ordinance revisions, uh, we needed to make sure that anything we were changing in the current chapters didn't leave anything out of the stormwater chapter. So those were some of the additions that we needed to make with this one. So I wanted to highlight just some of the new or what I would characterize as substantive changes to the ordinances. Um, actually one of the triggering events that really um, prompted our need for ordinance updates was the requirement from the Minnesota Health Department to deal with cross connection and backflow prevention in our water system. Um, as part of our sanitary survey that the Minnesota Department of Health does every three to five years for our potable drinking water system, any cross connections or problems with backflow is actually rep rep represented as a high hazard and can actually be flagged as a deficiency in our community water system. And it's a little bit complicated given um, we're a public water supplier and a lot of the problems happen inside buildings, inside private properties, so we needed to make additions to the ordinance that allowed us the opportunity to go in and implement backflow prevention programs. So that really was a triggering event. And again, once we started looking at that particular section where we needed to add that to the ordinances, we realized it really warranted a comprehensive overhaul and logical reorganization. Another new item that we're actually pretty excited about is um, in regards to water service line and sewer lateral, re lateral repairs and replacements. Uh, current ordinance specifies uh, property owners have five years um, to repay the, the cost of those repairs or replacements or as they're assessed to their property taxes. Um, the cost of these service line replacements has really gone up over the past years. An average water service line replacement is about $7,000. An average sanitary repair is about over $10,000. Obviously expecting property owners to repay that cost in a limited amount of time of five years is, can be very, very onerous on the property owner. So by state statute, we're actually allowed to have up to 20 years to prepay those assessments. And so the ordinance allows for that. The, the proposed ordinance changes allow for that. And then in addition, we're gonna be working with utility billing to make these assessment amounts reflected on their actual utility bills. It makes it more clear and communicating to the customers what their responsibilities are and really what's incorporated with their water, sanitary, and storm services. Another new item that actually came up last year during summer, during the uh, summer drought when we had to implement restrictions for the first time in, in over 30 years um, was actually taking a close look at water use during emergencies or declared drought emergencies. And previously, um, the first measure of enforcement if people were not following water restriction was shut off of water. Um, and that's not something we want to do and it's something we're moving away from as a drinking water utility altogether. So the proposed ordinances revisions actually allow for warnings um, subsequent fines and violations, and then in extreme measures, you know, if it's wil willful neglect that we c or willful disregard of the ordinances, in those extreme cases, we would still reserve the right to do a shutoff. Another cleanup that we had to do um, was in Section 510 in regards to the modification of the stormwater utility credit, and really it was cleaning up language to make sure that any um, stormwater um, management project that is performed in the right of way can receive the credit regardless of when it was constructed. Some other items we did and we talked about making this uh, you know, legible, readable, understandable was removing a lot of things that was really extra or not applicable to, these, to our water utilities. Uh, these were items that were included in the plumbing code, were actually referred to in other chapters of the ordinances, or really are more appropriately called out in our standard specifications that need to be updated on a regular basis. Um, we reorganized the chapters. Uh, this is the proposed markup as to what the uh, ordinance will read. Again, uh, rather than referring to sewage, sewers and sewage disposal, the proposed change uh, now the title will be water, stormwater, and sanitary sewer. 
Chapter 505 will be specific to billing, which moves content that was in other sections related to billing all within one chapter. Um, chapter 507 is now referred to general, again, to better reflect the general information that's in there. Chapter 509 will just reflect water, drinking water services. Chapter 510 clear, clearly is about stormwater management. And Chapter 511 is about the sanitary sewer system. Um, our interest in plain language and simplified message, um, just for general reference, um, you know, we went from very kind of wordy and, you know, old language type uh, legalese, I would say, to simple, clear reader messages. Um, we basically, the overall word count uh, for the three chapters was reduced by about 28%. For numbered lists, we wanted to move from, again, dense paragraphs. It was hard to find what you were talking and, refer and which items were referring to which you know, which subheadings are referring to which headings. So working with the clerk's office, we moved to the proper uh, formatted list in the new ordinance. And accessibility, well, there was a lot of, uh, when we were reviewing it, there's a lot of definitions that even we in the divisions and the technical experts weren't quite sure what we meant by that. So we eliminated redundant um, terms, consolidated the terms, and then created a clear list of definitions that apply to them. So again, um, the intent for this was to add some missing information, uh, clear, clearly lay out all the different chapters, make it accessible, and um, make sure that people that are referring to these ordinances really understand what's expected of uh, the city and of the people that need to comply with the different ordinances. So with that, that's my general overview, and I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bingstrom. We're going to go to the public hearing piece, and then we'll have any uh, comments or questions after that, if that's all right. Uh, so before I open the public hearing, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a public hearing on the water and sewer code revision, and so all public comments should pertain to the water and sewer code revision. With that, I'll open the public hearing, and I'm going to ask the clerk if anyone has signed up to speak. I am seeing a no. <laughs> um, seeing that no one has signed up to speak, I'll ask if there's anyone present who'd like to speak regarding the water and sewer code revision. So I see one person here. Come on up. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lucas Franco. I live at 4137 22nd Avenue South. Uh, in Minneapolis. I'm the research manager for the Laborers Union uh, uh, International of North America, or LEUNA, of Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, we are a construction labor union of approximately 13,000 members across the two states. Uh, nearly 600 of our members are residents of Minneapolis, and hundreds more work on local building, <clears throat> excuse me, and infrastructure construction projects that contribute to the vibrancy of the city that I call home. Our members work on a wide array of critical infrastructure, from roads and bridges to wind and solar projects uh, to critical water infrastructure in our city. We have two local unions within the city, Local 563 and Local 363, both located in Northeast Minneapolis. Local 563 members work in private sector construction, including water and sewer contractors that install, repair, and reline water, sewer, and stormwater lines and associated infrastructure in Minneapolis. Local 363 in Northeast Minneapolis represents City of Minneapolis Public Works and Parks Department employees who install and repair the city's critical water infrastructure. Together, 563 and 363 members play a really critical role in maintaining and building our uh, water infrastructure throughout the city. And these jobs have provided really good family sustaining careers for these folks, helping our residents, um, helping our residents that are members, and then also folks like myself uh, who are residents, that, uh, ensuring that we have safe and affordable water and sewer systems. So ultimately, I'm here today on behalf of Leuna just to seek clarity around the proposed ordinance amending Title 19 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to water, sewer, and uh, sewers and sewage disposal. We want to ensure that our members continue to have work opportunities to support their families, working on the city's water and sanitary sewer and stormwater systems, and that we maintain the skilled and diverse 
workforce and contractor base uh, needed to affordably and reliably maintain our water infrastructure. Ultimately, it's our understanding uh, that the proposed revisions are intended to clarify existing requirements or standards for contractors and workers performing work on water infrastructure in Minneapolis. If the ordinance did in fact change requirements regarding which agencies, contractors, or individuals may pull permits for, perform, or oversee work on water, sewer, or stormwater infrastructure, however, we would be very concerned uh, about the potential impact both on our members uh, and generally on the state of the city's infrastructure. So just in conclusion, we want to seek assurances that the proposal will not change existing practices when it comes to contractors and workers that currently perform critical infrastructure work within the city of Minneapolis. Uh, thank you all so much for your time and attention to this issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Uh, not seeing anybody else, I will close the public hearing on this item. Are there any questions from my committee members? Councilmember Chuktai. Thank you, Chair Kosky. I, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Director Bankston for coming in today. Um, she hosted us at our water treatment facility um, in Northeast and uh, the Northeast suburbs um, just a couple of weeks ago with uh, Director Anderson Kelleher and showed us around our incredible infrastructure um, that, that gives all of us um, our water and uh, really thankful for the work that you've done over um, the last year, many years, um, and and just thank you for coming and showing us. I know it's it, this part was a, a um, it wasn't as exciting as as like seeing our water move, uh, but we have public water. We're the, one of the first cities in the state to to make this type of critical investment in our infrastructure, um, and and it's like something we don't even think about anymore, but has a massive impact in everyone's lives. So thank you for your work. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. I'll move approval of this item. Uh, for all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and this committee's recommendation will be forwarded to the next week's council meeting for final action. Uh, our next discussion item today will be item number six, is the layout approval easement repealing a one-way street and establishing parking restrictions as part of the Hennepin Avenue South Street reconstruction project. Uh, Director Anderson uh, Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am going to say a few words first uh, before the introduction of our presenter today. This is almost four years in the making, Madam Chair and committee members, to get to the layout approval for Hennepin Avenue South. Hennepin Avenue South is approximately a 1.4 mile stretch of roadway. And this uh, layout was first presented to the previous council last fall. This layout that you will see today is 100% the same layout that was presented last fall. There are no changes to the layout. It will include better pedestrian facilities, It'll include a raised away from traffic bikeway. It'll include two-way traffic instead of four-way traffic on Hennepin Avenue, including separated medians, turn lanes that will help the flow of the traffic on Hennepin Avenue and increase the safety. We have been working closely with our partners at Metro Transit for many years now to be able to recommend this alignment that will also facilitate the E-Line BRT, ABRT. The ABRT line is a 14 mile line, this being 1.4 miles of that 14 miles, Edina into downtown Minneapolis. After four years today, Becca Hughes, who is the senior transportation, a senior transportation planner in transportation planning and programming, and Mr. Alan Klugman will be, who is a principal professional engineer in, tra in traffic and parking services, will be co-presenting. 
We also have available a representative from Metro Transit, I believe. Uh, the room is busy, so I'm not sure if Mr. Thompson is in the room or nearby, but uh, if he is, uh, or Katie Roth, uh, that Katie's nearby, um, that may be helpful as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Becca, Madam Chair. Thank you, welcome, Ms. Hughes. Good afternoon, Chair Kosky and committee members. Uh, again, I'm Becca Hughes, Senior Transportation Planner in Transportation Planning and Programming. First, thank you for allowing our project team the opportunity to present briefly to the committee and to address questions um, on the Hennepin Avenue South Reconstruction Project. Just a really quick preamble, this committee meeting is many years in the making, as Director Anderson Keller mentioned, a day perhaps a few of us were unsure would ever come. I want to first acknowledge the project team, of course, including our consultants and our partners at Metro Transit. This has been a most challenging and consuming project, and I could not be more honored to have worked with such skilled and dedicated professionals that care and are committed to our transportation action plan, our complete streets policy, and all of our other recent policy initiatives that prioritize climate, equity, mobility, safety, active partnerships, and prosperity, as well as reducing VMT, greenhouse gas emissions, and moving towards a mode split that will make sustainable strides toward a better Minneapolis. These goals and objectives have been the focus of our project team since the outset as we work to develop a transformational layout for this corridor that intentionally alters the design of the street for the next 50 years and that we anticipate will be a model for other streets with similar typologies, demands, perspective, opportunities, and challenges. In terms of previous actions, you'll recall that back in March of this year, And in March of this year, um, the department brought forth an action that allowed us to pursue a variance request from MnDOT state aid design standards regarding median width and bikeway clear zone and bikeway design speed. And these um, were officially approved through MnDOT's process uh, consistent with the layout before you today. So all of those improvements do apply to the layout that's before you today. So I'll begin um, with the request for council action. Of course, three of those are action. One is a resolution, um, first approving the layout. Secondary uh, is negotiating with property owners for easements um, and right of way, um, which is a typical approval that's associated with the layout approval of repealing a one-way street and installing parking restrictions on Fremont Avenue, as well as passage of a resolution establishing parking restrictions. And that's in accordance with the Minnesota state aid rules that we have because this is a state aid street. Project scope, I know all of you are all aware of the project scope at this point, but Douglas Avenue on the north is the northernmost boundary heading into downtown and extends south, again, about 1.4 miles on the Hennepin Avenue corridor to Lake Street. The last time the street was reconstructed was approximately 65 years ago. So in terms of existing conditions, of course, this graphic illustrates the typical conditions out on the Hennepin Avenue corridor today with pedestrian space that averages about 14 feet on each side, and of course, that includes both sidewalks and boulevard space where that is available. Um, there's also, of course, a dynamic transit lane that provides parking during the off-peak hours, and then, of course, there's full-time parking opposite the street from where we have those dynamic lanes striped. And, of course, there's four vehicle lanes as well. Um, there's currently not dedicated space, of course, for bicycle facilities on the corridor, and when we add up all of this space, we have about 88 feet of right-of-way to work with, which isn't a lot, uh, certainly when we're trying to accommodate as much as we are on this corridor, including our modal networks as well as all of our desired enhancements. So this is our favorite photo. We use it I, probably in every presentation we've given, but this really just shows a graphic illustration of the existing conditions, again, out on the corridor that have, again, remained largely unchanged over the last 65 years. Of course, the exception to that is the integration of the offset bi-directional dynamic transit lanes that we first piloted in partnership with Metro Transit in 2018 and then fully implemented in 2019. Uh, these transit lanes have proven very successful in terms of their improving reliability since their implementation, so they've been very successful. Our policy plans. I won't say too much about the policy plans. I know you've been briefed on the policy plans. Policy plans, however, are a huge foundation, are the basis of our recommendation. And anytime we bring a layout forward, our policy plans are essentially where we start. Of course, they're the foundation for our recommended design, and we've also integrated that with extensive technical analysis on this corridor as well as public feedback. This almost feels like a disservice to show one slide on project engagement, but we did start project engagement back in 2018. We had our sort of re-kickoff for the project in September and October of 2020, our third round last spring, and then we released our recommended layout again in December of 2021, and then we basically took comments on that recommended layout through January. 
We've had over 60 neighborhood business special service districts and property owner meetings and open house and virtual meetings. And we've received more than 10,000 comments and that's certainly a huge number. And as you can see from the bar chart that's represented on the right side of your screen, that of course as we became um, more detailed in terms of our design, had more details fleshed out about how we wanted to redesign the corridor, the more comments that we received on that. In terms of existing transportation users, again, this is just to remind you of what we have on an average day out in the corridor. It is one of the busiest corridors by far in the city of Minneapolis. It has the highest pedestrian volumes near the southerly portion of the corridor, concentrated near the intersections of Lake and Lagoon specifically. Um, it's also a very heavily used transit corridor, which was part of the reason, of course, we implemented the transit lanes in 2019. Uh, there are no bicycle facilities along the corridor, but it is still used as such, uh, which is part of the reason, of course, why uh, we are integrating a dedicated facility on the corridor as part of the redesign. And then vehicle volumes are high. Uh, they are lowest at the southerly portion of the corridor, closest to Lake Street, they're about 15,000. And then up in the northern part, approaching the I-94 ramps, they're about 30,000 or double that amount. So this slide, we've used this in several presentations as well, but basically what this is meant to show is that the existing roadway has many issues. Of course, this was reconstructed last 65 years ago, and what we've done is we've worked um, with our new design to mitigate and address these issues. I feel like there might be a timer on here or something. Um, so this is again, just you know how we've addressed it, how we've mitigated, how the degree to which we've been able to mitigate and address these various issues, and I won't go into a ton of detail here, but we can certainly address this later. I think it's really important to note here just the extensive data collection efforts that we've utilized throughout this process, the analysis that has gone into it, um, involved in the decision making, and it's recommended essentially in the recommended physical layout for the corridor. So this is our base section, and I know you're all familiar with this. This is the base section that we released in December. This is the base section that we've shared publicly. This is what we received public comment on beginning in December through January of last year. And this is the very same base section that we are looking for layout approval today. And basically what you can see in terms of features is that of course we have sidewalks and green space where we can in the base section on both sides of the street. We have the integration of the two-way protected bike facility on the east side of the corridor, two curbside dedicated transit lanes in each direction as well as one lane in each direction. And then of course we have the variable median, which we feel is a really key feature uh, to the redesign of the corridor. It really helps with access control, precluding mid-block left-hand turns and really improving safety for all of the users, including uh, pedestrians and cyclists, which are currently overrepresented in injury accidents based on statistics um, and the current design that we have out on the corridor today. This is what the cross-section looks like essentially at the left turn lane. So we have left turn lanes that are situated at key locations throughout the entire corridor. Um, again, this shows the street section at an intersection with the left-hand turn lanes. The left-hand turn lanes are something that doesn't exist out on the corridor today, so they're important for vehicle circulation and mobility, and this section occurs specifically at the intersections of 22nd, 24th, 26th, and 28th, so we have it essentially at alternating intersections. Um, with this space needed for the turn lane, at this point the median is removed from this section because we simply don't have the space to accommodate it. Um, you can see that the shifting of the boulevard um, on the right side of your screen adjacent to the bikeway is a transitional space. It occurs at all intersections even when there isn't a left hand turn. Um, it does create and allow space for, for vehicles um, to yield to certainly people that are walking and biking and also to improve those sight lines. Um, we also maintain a one foot buffer which is the requirement between the sidewalk and the bikeway in this cross section. And you can also see that as we approach intersections, this is our most constrained environment. This is our most constrained location as we design the corridor. And you can see that the bikeway is actually reduced from the 10 foot standard, which it is for the majority of the corridor, uh, down to eight feet. And then transitioning into what it looks like when we integrate parking and loading bays throughout the corridor. Um, of course, this has been a huge uh, point of contention is how much parking is being removed and how many parking bays are not being put back. Uh, there are currently 311 spaces out on the corridor today. We have a space for about 20 parking and loading bays that we have distributed um, in locations where they're most desired and frankly where they fit given the constraints and the, the amount of right of way that we're dealing with. This is just a plan view, so just really to walk through, and then I'm gonna actually turn this over to Alan after this, but this is our plan view section, and really just wanted to pinpoint a couple of locations. This is the intersection of Hennepin and 25th, and so you can see some of the key critical design features that we have included in this layout. Again, you can see the two-way 
east side protected bicycle facility that runs along the corridor. Um, you can see the two priority transit lanes that are in both the north and the southbound direction. You can see the reduction, again, in through lanes down to one lane in each direction, as well as the median, which is creating a separation between those north and southbound lanes. Um, and one additional point, and Alan can speak to this in more detail too, but we do have additional vehicle lanes at both the north and the south portions of the corridor. And the reason for that is specifically at the lake and lagoon intersection, we have short blocks and lots of turning movements. Um, so we will have additional vehicle lanes there. And then we have also um, at the end point closest to the Franklin Avenue intersection. And so there, there are more vehicle lanes there to accommodate both the traffic going into and on, on and off the I-94 ramps. Also just to point out a couple more things with my cursor here, parking and loading bays, that's an example of one. Of course, a huge feature of, of this project is how closely we've worked with Metro Transit on integration of the BRT platforms and supporting E-Line operations in the future. So you can see both the north and southbound far side stops that will be uh, constructed along with this project. And then one feature, which um, <clears throat> this might be one of my favorite features or probably the favorite feature in this layout is really our ability to have some enhanced pedestrian crossings, specifically at two locations where we have really long blocks. Uh, there are, there double, if not more, uh, the typical length of a block. And so we do have signalized pedestrian intersections both at the Fremont and 25th and a half uh, street locations. So it will allow for better mobility, um, allow people to cross uh, in locations where there are higher pedestrian volumes. And then one more slide for me. Uh, this is showing many of the same features, but the difference here, of course, is that this is a location specifically at 28th Street. Again, locations at 22nd, 24th, 26th, and 28th where we have dedicated left-hand turns. You can see them in both directions. Uh, and you can also see um, the, that essentially what that means, again, is the removal of the median at that location. I'll, I'll say that we will be looking at different ways of um, buffering that, yeah, despite the fact that it won't be necessarily a concrete median. Again, the integration of the parking and loading bays where we're able to fit them and where it makes sense. The east side bikeway is, of course, there. And then, again, looking at uh, the dedicated bus lanes that we have in either direction. Um, one other thing to note, too, is just we are paying attention to how this corridor uh, intersects with the existing bike facilities. So 26th and 28th currently have protected bicycle facilities um, and how we transition uh, the, the bikers um, to that directionality, so to speak, in a protected way through that intersection. And I'm going to turn it over to Alan here. And he, oh, I have one more, sorry. Um, and then one other approval that we have is um, regarding Fremont Avenue. And this would be the Kowalskis that's just off of your screen. This is a proposal that we will be changing this to two-way operation. And part of that is being responsive to working directly with Kowalskis. But basically what this does in essence um, is it complements, of course, our new corridor layout design um, because of the changing circulation and traffic patterns. Um, it will benefit certainly the northbound drivers, right, that are looking to transition and make that left-hand turn. Southbound drivers, there'll be no change, uh, but because of the median that we have located here, they'll have to make this maneuver onto 24th and onto Fremont. So this will be a conversion, just this short segment. It's about 180 feet um, from one way to two way, as well as removing parking on the east side, which accounts for about nine existing spaces out on Fremont Avenue now. We will retain the parking on the west side of that street. Okay, it is your turn. Thank you. Thanks, Becca. Madam Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon. Again, my name is Alan Klugman. I'm a principal professional engineer with the Traffic and Parking Services Division of Public Works. Um, and I, I love seeing this layout, and I especially love seeing the photo that Becca showed earlier, because that shows the road that was built 65 years ago. We're now looking to what will this road look like for the next 50, 60 plus years. And as the director noted, and as Becca talked about, Today we're here to talk about the physical design, the physical space layout of this roadway, and that's the approval we're looking for. But as with any large construction project, we always layer on top of that in an operational plan. We do that with every big project. And that's what I want to talk about today, the operations that we propose to integrate in with the physical construction that you see on the screen here. And when I talk about the operational plan for this corridor, there's two main things that I want to talk about. The first item is to consider and utilize a flexible or dynamic approach to the curbside lane. I'll talk about that in the specifics. And the second operational plan that we want to speak about is to look at a more area-wide approach to parking. 
As Becca noted, there are a number of parking spaces that will be leaving Hennepin with this physical construction. We do have thoughts and plans how we can help serve that demand in the nearby area. So first let me talk about the notion of dynamic operation of the transit priority lane. And I wanna to speak to two things. One is how would we go about determining what hours it's used for transit versus what hours it may be used for parking. And the second item I wanna speak about is how will we manage that lane to ensure understandability of its use and to ensure compliance with what it is during different times of the day. So first, let's talk about the hours of operation. Now we don't have that set yet. This project, we'll be talking about schedule later in this presentation. This project is not open till fall of 2025 or spring of 2026. So we have about four years to work on that and then to continue on beyond that. But the most basic point I can say and the most strongest point I can say is that we will absolutely do that in collaboration with Metro Transit. We greatly, greatly support the E-Line and want to see and need to say it operate efficiently. And the reason I can say so confidently that we will work effectively with Metro Transit is because that's nothing new for us. We do that all the time. We actually, in addition to countless, actually uncountable number of meetings and phone calls we have with Metro Transit, we have standing monthly meetings, our traffic operations staff, with the Metro Transit bus operations staff and a separate meeting with the LRT staff. In fact, by sheer coincidence of calendar, our May meeting for the bus operations discussion in the city of Minneapolis was earlier this morning. So we have a long history of working with Metro Transit with both their planners and their engineers, and actually now they have data scientists. I'm actually on a first name basis with the Metro Transit data scientists. That's how much we work with their data. So as we look into the future, as we redesign the road, and have a better understanding of what those traffic flows are like, we'll have a very good understanding of when it's most advantageous to provide the exclusive bus lane. It'll be based on data, it'll be done in collaboration with Metro Transit. Quickly, I'll just say, in terms of why I feel so good about this, the strongest partnership we have in the Minneapolis Traffic Group is with our partners at Metro Transit. It's why already today as I stand here, we have 120 signalized intersections in the city of Minneapolis that have special transit signal priority equipment in our traffic control cabinet to speed the buses or the light rail through those corridors. It's why we've done the other transit enhancement projects over the last several years. So clearly we won't be doing this in a vacuum. We'll cooperate with Metro Transit on what those hours need to be. The second part of the dynamic operation is the notion of how do we secure those lanes? How do we make sure they're used properly by the different times of day? And two things I wanna speak about. One is that if you look at Hennepin today, we have meters today from Lake Street up to 28th. North of there, it's really a parking free-for-all. We do not have active management of that. Clearly in the future, we will look to meter Hennepin when we're using it dynamically. That starts to give us the better understandability of when those lanes are used for transit, when those lanes are used for parking. And if, if you think about our current electronic meter system, we can dial in or dial out the hours of operation. And literally, you cannot pay for the meter when parking is not allowed. And in fact, when we look at our customers today, we're now up to over 65% of our customers are using the parking app on their phone to pay the meter. And that number is only growing year by year. So when we look out into the future, if a new visitor is coming to Minneapolis and trying to understand Hennepin Avenue, they'll just look at their phone and know if they can park or not. So we're very certain that we'll have good compliance with operation out here. And the second part of the compliance is with the full rebuild that we're talking about now, we'll have the opportunity to have very robust signing, marking, and management so that the public clearly understands the use of the lane. If we look at the picture at the bottom, when we did the retrofit on Hennepin a couple years ago, we had budget to put up one electronic sign to denote when the parking hours are versus the bus hours. In the future with a full rebuild, we'll have many, many more of those signs, very much like you see downtown today with Marquette and Second Avenue, where we use dynamic signing to indicate when parking is available. So we do feel that the, work, the lane will work very successfully. And with this next slide here, I just wanna give a quick idea of how that might look like in the future. Now clearly we haven't worked out those hours yet. We'll be back before council when we do that and we'll review that with you. But what we're gonna do is look at the data, work with Metro Transit, and these are the sorts of themes we'd be looking for. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just give you an overview. We kind of have a little um, schematic here where yellow represents the morning period, the gray line represents the evening period. And if you think about the morning, we have very high peaking traffic, a lot of commuters heading up towards the freeway and heading into downtown. So what we know about the morning is that high peak, not for real long period of time. If we contrast that with the afternoon, 
different types of trips, not just work trips, but shopping, taking the kids to soccer practice, what have you, we see more of a bi-directional flow of traffic and the volumes stay fairly high for a longer number of hours. Another thing we notice in the PM when we look at the data is that we need to be flexible in thinking about how we would use these lanes because we see breaks in the traffic counts. Now clearly, the higher the traffic volume, the more necessity there is for an exclusive bus lane. But for example, if you look at the corridor today, north of 25th, the traffic volumes are much higher northbound than south of 25th. So maybe in the future, when we consider dynamic lane arrangement, we may not do it quarter-wide, we might do it in segment. Again, I don't mean to conclude anything here. There's years and years of data collection and analysis ahead of ourselves. We just wanted to give an indication of how we'd approach the situation. Now, as we look at the use of uh, Hennepin for parking part of the time, we want to kind of start to blend it in with the notion that second operational strategy I talked about, the area parking approach. So if we look at the chart on the left, and this is just an example, we kind of did a sample of what might the parking count on Hennepin look like throughout the different periods of the day. 311 parking stop spots today. In the future, even if there was no bus being used, we'd have 268 parking stalls. So with some of the features Becca talked about, the left turn lanes, the transit stations, 268 is how many parking spaces we can fit along Hennepin. And the notion with this graph that we're showing is that at different times of the day, based on whether we have the lane on one side or both sides or for what length of the corridor, the number of parking stalls would vary. There'd always be some about along Hennepin. But the second part of that, I wanna blend into the idea of area-wide parking approach, is we need to think outside the Hennepin corridor for what are the parking resources that serve the businesses and the activities along Hennepin. And with the picture on the right, we kind of speak to that. Right now, the number you've all heard, 311 spaces on Hennepin, but that's really only part of the overall parking resource in the area. If we take a little broader view, go within one block of Hennepin, look at the side streets in addition to Hennepin, today we have 3,600 parking spaces in and around Hennepin. Some of those on the public street, the curb sites that we control, some of them in the nearby off-street lots and ramps, obviously controlled by private sector. Our notion with the area-wide parking plan is to look to better, better utilize those resources to support the activities along Hennepin. Now, the gray part of this graphic, the cross-street, on-street parking, that's real estate that we control. That's the curb line on those nearby cross-streets, or because Hennepin runs at an angle, it's some of those north-south streets that intersect with it. Now, just like Hennepin north of 28, that parking's a free-for-all today. We clearly think in the future that we need to better manage, mark, sign, and meter that so that it can be used as a parking and loading resource for Hennepin. And I'd like to give you one quick example. Many, many years ago, we established a zone. If you think of where the New Horizons Daycare Center is, it's on the east side of Hennepin, north of 25th. Many, many years ago, we established a 15-minute parking zone on the east side of Hennepin so that the parents could park for a brief amount of time, drop off their kids inside, and return to their car. In 2019, when we implemented the Red Bus Lane project, we obviously couldn't have the parking and the drop-off going on when the bus lane was active. So we worked with New Horizons we relocated their drop-off zone, or excuse me, parking zone, to a nearby side street, to Emerson, on the side of the building. Therefore, we were able to provide the parking resource they needed. It just wasn't on the Hennepin storefront site, it was on a side street. That's just one example of the sorts of activities we'll look to be doing in the future to again use the resources we control to better manage parking. At the same time, we really look forward to working with the private entities to help them reimagine, rethink about the space they control that's another resource for Hennepin. Now really quickly, in terms of what that might, might look like, and this is just a schematic. Again, we'll be back to you as we work on this plan. But we've kind of gone block by block up and down the corridor and said, where are those nearest curbs most beneficial to the businesses, maybe based on which businesses have parking behind the building or not, and which roads have availability? For example, if there's a bike lane, maybe that's not a road we look to put parking. If there's a, a road that is more open, if you will, we can better manage that and make it a resource for Hennepin. So again, we don't mean this is a finished product. We just want to let you know we start to think about what does that operations plan look like. This is something we'll be back to you in the coming years to tell you what we've come up with. Now in a moment here, um, I'm going to turn it back to Becca and she'll finish up with a couple of items first. But I just want to wrap up one more thing about the operation plan. And I just want to make a comment to you because I know I've gone through a lot of material, you probably have some questions on it. But in summary about the operation plan, I want to say that what we're talking about is not unique to Minneapolis. 
We started to, bit, to do bits of this ourselves with area parking, dynamic lanes, but we're in constant contact with many, many other cities throughout the US. In all cities like Minneapolis, we're kind of in the same situation. We're reimagining our streets. We're rethinking our streets for the next 50, 60 plus years. We want to make them more narrow and safer. We want to make them more multimodal. We have competing demands on the road. We need to overlay an operational strategy on top of that physical design to achieve that. So the techniques we're talking about today with dynamic use of the lanes and area parking, I just want to tell you, we're not the only ones looking at that. These have been successful strategies elsewhere, and I know they can be successful strategies for Hennepin. So we're really looking forward to implementing those. Now in closing, I'm going to turn it over to Becca, and she'll talk a little bit about the schedule, and then she'll finish up with a recap of the actions we're requesting. Thank you. All right, very quickly, <clears throat> in terms of the project schedule, as you can see um, with the little green dots here, these are the three rounds of engagement that we've had since 2020. So this has, again, been a, a long uh, time coming in terms of the work that we've been doing out in the community and the conversations that we've been having as well as our preliminary planning and engineering. Um, we are now at this point of looking to secure layout approval. And along with that, we're doing a lot of other work. We're doing utility coordination. Um, we're in the process of being wanting to kick off final engineering, which that depends upon whether we're able to secure layout approval. But ultimately, big picture, um, as Alan mentioned earlier, street reconstruction would not begin until 2024. So we've got, again, about two years, or a little less than that, of course, until street reconstruction begins. We have two years of construction. There's a lot of work and a lot of conversations that need to happen, not just with business owners um, and Metro Transit, but also just you know how we stage, how we construct this, how we support businesses during construction. Um, we've heard that throughout community engagement, and we're committed to making sure uh, that we continue those conversations over the course of the next couple of years. So again, quickly to summarize, uh, Three actions in front of us, one resolution, one requesting approval of the layout that's before you today, authorizing Public Works to work with the property owners, again, for easements and right-of-way, which is a, a, a typical accompanying uh, action that comes along with the layout, again, repealing the one-way street on Fremont Avenue and installing parking restrictions on the east side of Fremont, and last but not least, the passage of resolution um, establishing parking restrictions as required because of the fact that uh, Hennepin Avenue is a state aid street. And I'll close there, and we're happy to address any questions you have. Thank you so much for the thorough presentation. I appreciate it. Um, are there any questions from committee members? Councilmember Payne. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so there's some things, it, a lot of the work that we're doing as policymakers is trying to define problems in a way that we can solve them. And for me, this redesign layout is solving the problem of road deaths, it's solving the problem of um, bikeability, or lack of bikeability, lack of pedestrian access. Um, and the dedicated bus lanes is solving the challenge of shifting uh, vehicle miles from individual cars to public transit. So that's like a very clear solution to a very clear problem. I don't have a great understanding of what's the specific problem we're solving with the dynamic bus lanes. Because as I kind of do my quick math, it looks like we're talking about a 6% delta when it comes to avail parking availability within the corridor. So can we speak to the specific problem that that's aiming to solve? Madam Chair, Council Member, members of the committee. Yes, so in, I'll start to answer, maybe there'll be a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the problem that we're trying to solve, and I want to refer back to something Becca said, for all of our work here, quickly, we start with policy, we do our technical analysis, we, in, we involve the public with engagement and feedback. And we do have a multimodal approach here where we're trying to serve all the stakeholders in the corridor. And we do feel that it's, a, um, it's been a difficult time on Hennepin, we all know that and we're gonna have a difficult time with some construction, and we wanna maintain the flexibility. Again, we're not setting hours here. We wanna maintain the flexibility that as we finish construction and look at the business climate, look at the future, we have the tools we need to possibly parking on the corridor for some limited hours with the transition plan to get the full-time dynamic lane, full-time busing. We wanna have that flexibility, have that tool in our toolkit. So that, that's really, I think, my brief answer to you, Council Member. 
Um, and then reference to the 6% relative to the 3,600. Um, we, totally, we, we totally agree with your math, but what we've heard is that you know, not all parking spaces are the same, right? And um, you know, part of our 3,600, of course, includes the large lots, includes the ramps. If you're the barber shop up around 23rd, you know, the, the ramp down um, near Lake Street may not be a resource for you. So we want to be respectful that we do feel the number paints an accurate picture, that there's strong resources in the corridor, but we do know there is some value to the nearby parking. Another thing if I could just quickly say is we very much look forward to getting layout approval. And then to me, that's a milestone where we then can more seriously engage the businesses, I have been serious before, but more in a more detailed fashion, engage the businesses with how do we make this uh, area-wide parking management system work, right? And to the degree that that's a more robust and successful program, that will downplay the need or desire for parking on Hennepin. So it's partly why we're trying to come here today with a flexible approach. We know we have a lot of homework ahead of ourselves for the next three to four years, but those are the sorts of things we're thinking about when we try to say what's the optimal solution and can we retain enough tools to get there? A, a follow-up question would be around the scale of the problem that we're trying to solve. So for me, like it, it's a v immediately clear that the scale of climate change requires a fairly significant scale of a, of a policy solution. And as we're talking about, um, again, the 6%, which that's a really good point if yeah. You're not, the parking structure is over on uh, you know, Lake Street and you want to shop on Franklin, the parking structure is probably not going to solve for you, right? But I'm trying to match our solution to the scale of the problem and the scale of climate change is this thing that we can't even fully comprehend. Whereas I feel like the, the scale of our parking challenge is much more finite. And I'm just curious, are we scaling our solution to that problem appropriately? Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, council member, members of the committee, I do understand your question, and that's a hard one for me to comment on, and I, I don't mean to be repetitive or to answer your questions. It's partly why we want to retain the tools. And we do feel we very much want to promote the mode shift. It, it's probably one of the pride and things I've done in my career the last 10 years with a number of bus projects. We'll talk about that some other time. Um, but what we want to have available is clearly, clearly the number of hours of lanes that serve the bus when they need it so that it is that speedy and reliable transit trip. The, the two most important things for transit are speed and reliability. We all know that. We need to deliver that on the corridor. We feel that it's probably something less than 24 hours in which the bus needs that lane. I think that's the reason why we're saying let's retain some ability for dynamic lanes. One thing I want to point out, I think Becca spoke to this. We feel that our new design, although it gets more narrow, it's a very efficient design because of the median that'll ban left turns and then left turns only at major intersections with turn base. We think this is going to be a very smoothly flowing road with good traffic capacity. And it's partly why we want to have a little bit of a wait and see attitude that in kind of those off peak hours, if traffic is flowing well, and we have the Metro Transit statistics, by the way, they have the most sophisticated statistics set I've ever seen. They have automatic vehicle location devices on every bus, every trip, every day, every route, every trip is logged. We look at that data with Metro Transit, so we very much know how their buses are performing. And if there's hours, where the bus is performing well mixed in with general traffic, we'd like to retain the possibility, the flexibility, and have that parking available. And then a uh, follow-up on that, because it just reminded me of a question I had during the presentation. Um, the traffic patterns that we're measuring today, and we can have a very like rigorous statistical analysis of, the, uh, analysis of those traffic patterns, are we doing a statistical projection based on that historical trend data? Is that, is that kind of the direction we're going in right now? Yeah, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, council member, very good question. So obviously it's been a difficult time the past two, two plus years now to get a good read on what, what the traffic forms are, but let me just give you a quick recap of what we've done. The initial planning for this project started in 2018. Our base set of data was 2018. I'll start by saying that. We've continued to get Metro Transit bus travel time throughout 18, 19 pandemic up to today. So we have very good bus data. Um, in terms of traffic counts, we last recounted the corridor in fall of 2021. So not really post pandemic, but kind of starting to return to normal. We'll have another couple of years. I think your question was projections. I'll get there. We have another couple of years to kind of see what's the trend lines, what's traffic, you know, what are the counts like, and then we'll go under construction. So we are basing it, um, we are basing it on a composite of what we see in the past, understanding there's a new normal that has some lower volumes 
but some sense that those are continuing to pick up. So when we forecast into the future, we don't really forecast growth in vehicle, excuse me, automobile trips. We forecast a growth in people as the corridor gets more dense. For example, if you look at the old Chicago site, we now have 150 plus apartment units coming there, right? Right by the transit station. So the corridor is getting more dense. There's more people, there's more person trips. We wanna provide the facilities that move them onto other modes. So we're kind of blending all that to get a count and that's one of the reasons why we kind of want to have a little bit of a wait and see attitude on these hours. That's why my graphic didn't show proposed hours is we really need to see in the future after 2025, 26, what are traffic patterns looking like in the city? How is this new road performing? And then we can overlay the bus travel time statistics to come up with the best answer for everyone. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, Council member Wansley Wardaba. Oh, was I first? I didn't know who, if, who was, all right. Um, I put myself in queue as well. So uh, I just had a couple questions. I don't know if this would be for a director or for either of you, but I just want to confirm today, I think it's been said a couple times, but that we are um, confirmed that the layout plan before us is the same layout plan that was presented previously um, and that that layout plan itself has not changed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, that's 100% correct. The layout is consistent and constant from what we showed last fall. Okay, and then just a follow-up question. I just also want to confirm that the item before us today is the layout plan. You talked about an operational plan, but today we are voting on our layout plan. Madam Chair, members of the committee, that's correct. Yes, only the layout. Thank you. Those are my questions. So, Council Member Wansley, where are Thank you, Chair Koski, and I have more of a comment um, that kind of relates to Council Member Payne's um, thoughts about um, how we're adjusting our layout proposal or operational proposals um, to parking. So I just wanted to note that while I believe we should have 24-7 bus lanes operating from day one um, during the reopening of uh, Hennepin Ave, I would also like to ask our staff and encourage my fellow colleagues to also think about the practicality of what's being asked here. Um, if construction takes two years, there is a very good chance, it seems, that there, the current 311 parking spots that's being discussed today will also no longer be available during that time. So if anything, for continuity, it seems like it would be nice that the parking spots um, that might be gone for those two years, regardless, we should still have 24-7 bus lines be rolled out immediately. Um, and any questions regarding the functionality or ridership can be informed based off of that data from the proactive jump. So I think there's also a concern of we can still get that data that I think Council Member Payne was referring to even with the implementation of the 24-7 bus uh, lanes and, and not having these flexible hours kind of in, in flux <laughs> as well. So that's more so of a comment. I know this, uh, as you can see, we have a full room. This, this issue is so important. Um, I know for me and my ward, the E-line will be going through it. Um, and I know my ward is also one of the few, I think the only ward in the city that has a great student um, population. And many of those students are moving away from campus as rents increase, and they often are reliant upon um, our public transportation to be able to get around to campus. So having 24-7 access to a bus lane uh, for working class people as well as our students is so important to them, especially when we're talking about safety. I think public safety goes beyond just policing, of course, but it goes to can you also catch a bus at 12 o'clock or 12 a.m. or 2 a.m. to get from point A to point B. So I really encourage, uh, I think many of us want to have the guarantee that this 24 seven bus lane is gonna be operating on the first day when this project um, officially you know, begins. Thank you for your comments, appreciate that. And Councilmember Chuck Tai, I see you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Hughes um, and um, Alan, I don't know how to say your last name, it stresses me. Um, but I actually wanna start by um, thanking you for your years of work in bringing this plan um, and this layout to us for approval. Um, I have watched um, countless of those uh, community engagement sessions, um, especially when they first became virtual, and then all the way through as you 
um, as you navigated the really tough questions and really real concerns that residents and business owners um, and visitors brought and and asked, um, and and you know I think uh, I think to Becca especially I. Um, I have a, a deep level of appreciation for the kindness and the grace um, that you have shown our residents over and over in hearing their concerns and taking them seriously um, and doing your best to get to a meaningful answer to what people were asking and to address the core of the concern that people were bringing and being able to see that through hurt and frustration. That's a really difficult skill to have. Um, and, and both of you, um, I've, I've watched you grow in, in that skill and, and just want to thank you for your work. Um, almost all of us on this, com no, all of us today on this committee are brand new council members. And so we come and we look at this project, um, with fresh eyes, um, and, and, you know, want to hold that with with honoring your years of expertise on this. So I'll start there. Um, and then, you know, I think just hearing some of my colleagues talk about this, I want to, you know, start by with a couple of comments, perhaps questions um, to uh, Chair Kosky's question around what we are approving today, and that being specifically the layout. I actually want to point us back to um, the sub items within our agenda and I think one of the first slides that, that Becca started with today, which talks about the four separate things that we are going to be approving today and um, at council next Thursday. Um, and that includes, yes, approving the layout for the street reconstruction, it's authorizing negotiations with private properties for easements and uh, right of way. So just how, and to my understanding, that's just how we move sidewalks and, and like uh, making sure that we're working with, with our private property owners to, to make that work. Um, it's repealing that one way on, on Fremont. So it's, that was the taking that one way, turning it into a two-way street so that we can better allow for traffic circulation in that area. Um, and then the fourth, and I actually think this one's really, really important for us to get extremely clear on, um, is the passage of the resolution um, directing the city engineer to establish parking restrictions on Hennepin Avenue between Douglas Avenue and West Lake Street per the council approved layout to meet state aid rule um, 8820. So parking restrictions are inherent to this layout approval because that's literally one of the things that's in front of us that we are going to vote on today and then again um, next Thursday. So, I you know, yes, we're here to approve layout and uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, with that being said, um, I, I, I want to go back to uh, something you said earlier um, during your presentation um, on the, the block around uh, Franklin Avenue and then Lagoon, was it, where the street's a little narrower or, or perhaps has a little bit more space on Franklin and, and narrower on the Lagoon side, and per, like something around parking restrictions in that area. Can you please clarify that point, please? Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Council Member, maybe I'll start, and I think Becca's going to pull okay. up the layout. We Thank didn't you. show up, but we have the full corridor layout. Um, I think what I'll start, I'll start generally and get more specific if that's helpful. Um, generally speaking, we call this a two-lane roadway with left turns at about every other intersection. Up at Franklin, where there's just frankly much higher traffic counts, we need a little bit more lane capacity. And so rather than kind of that two-lane section, it's more of a four-lane section. I don't want to get too lost in the details, but one of the reasons for that too is southbound, we need to have two lanes coming through through Franklin, otherwise we would see very long backups. There'd be a safety issue. We would see backups to the freeway off-ramp to Hennepin. Uh -huh. And then once I have two lanes coming through southbound of Franklin, I need to have two receiving lanes to pick them up. So, and then northbound too, volumes, that's my highest point of volume in the corridor, we need a little bit more capacity. Now, switching gears at the south end of the corridor between Lake and Lagoon, volumes are not as high there, but we have two things going on. We have Lake Street and Lagoon, which have very high volumes, so kind of in a signal operations. I'm getting way into the weeds here. From a signal <laughs> operations point of view, I need to provide a fair amount of green time for East, West, Lake, and Lagoon, for example, to progress the new B-Line um, BRT through those intersections. That doesn't leave me as much green time for um, Hennepin. 
And with the large number of turns, even though the overall volume is a bit high, with the large amount of turns and the need to give some time to Lake and Lagoon, I just need that lane capacity in Hennepin to get the vehicles through. So that's kind of a, hopefully a, a sufficient answer. We could go more into the details or look at the layout, but that's the rationale. We're sort of changing the endpoints a bit. Got it. So it's almost like a, an on-ramp to uh, the traffic going down to one lane from, from the two and also serves the purpose of accounting for that's where we have higher uh, rates of traffic. Yeah, that's our, that's, those are our big um, kind of call it mobility challenge points in the corridor to keep yeah. the corridor moving smoothly. It's the two endpoints. That's really helpful. Thank you. That clarifies uh, my question. Um, you know, speaking to, uh, I think uh, maybe you were answering a question from um, Council Member Payne um, around, you know, not each, not every parking spot is, is made equal, right? Um, and uh, I appreciated the, the point on the barbershop on 23rd. Um, and, you know, it like reminded me uh, to, to bring up again, right, we're here on the public record, we're, we're talking about real concerns that real people have about the impact on their lives. Um, and, and Becca, as you know, right, like we're working with somebody on 23rd and Hennepin who we didn't know existed until just a few days ago who reached out to our office and, and then met with you directly, Becca, um, because we found... 45 to 50 new parking spots we didn't even know about because this person has a, has like sub basement basement parking that they want to work with the city on for us to be able to contract for the public to be able to use right so that 23rd through 25th um and i see mumtaz is here from osman cleaners on on 25th and hennepin right so that that area um we're, we're already thinking of some of these creative parking solutions and people in our community are reaching out to us and helping us get to those creative solutions in the here and now, two years out from construction even starting. Um, and so, you know, like you just brought the, it was just a barbershop on 23rd that reminded me of this very important point to make. Um, so, that being said, um, I actually, I wonder if we can, um, and I'm, you know, I'm not sure if this is a good question to direct at the two of you or to the director, um, but can you talk a little bit about item number four, the, the passage of resolution directing the city engineer to establish parking restrictions on Hennepin Avenue South? Madam Chair, members of the community council, or maybe I'll start and others can join in. Um, in terms of a road project, if I can use the word, that's more of a housekeeping detail. And I know the word parking is maybe kind of a, you know, an emotional word today. But <laughs> because we have federal and state aid funds on this project, we don't control everything. We have to abide by the rules. And for any roadway layout that comes through, we basically need to designate how's that pavement being used. And if it's being used as parking or not parking or lane or what have you. And so the no parking resolution is the city council mechanism for sort of certifying how the roadway is being used, and we give that back to the state and the federal authorities for approval of the use of the funds. So um, it happens on virtually every road project. It's kind of like I say, it's typically a housekeeping detail, but we need a council resolution, much like we need layout approval, to give back to the state to say this is the road we, pro we propose to build. So it's kind of, I know we're talking about dynamic lanes and operations and when that, it's somewhat apart from that, that even in a more, if I can say, um, straightforward plane project without dynamic operations, we'd have a similar activity going on based on how it is we're using the lanes. So Madam Chair and Council Member Chuck Tai, thank you for that question. I would like to bring in uh, Ms. Bremer from the city attorney's office into this discussion for the purpose of clarification of that resolution. Thank you, Director uh, Chair Koski and um, Council Member Chuck Tai. I'd want to point out that um, the uh, subsections three and four um, are part of the layout, but they're also different um, in that subsection four is a resolution that is not actually required by city ordinance or resolution. It's required by our state and federal funders. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something that um, the city itself would need to pass in order to do its work, it just needs to do it to receive those funds on this project. Um, as for subsection three of the repealing the one-way street, um, 
because it's of a repeal and not an establishment of a one-way street, um, the city council does need to assist uh, or direct the um, public works to do that. But the establishment of one-way streets, as well as many, many other um, operational procedures, um, operational decisions are delegated to the city engineer and to the director of public works, not to city council. And so city council doesn't have the authority to direct um, those sort of operational dis uh, decisions except in these rare circumstances. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, director, and to and, uh, um, our city attorney's office. Uh, you know, I, I think that... Um, I think that was incredibly clarifying. What I'm hearing from this is um, that it's the the state and the federal government that have whose whose funds we actually need in order to move forward with this project. Otherwise, it's just a cute idea. To require this council, this body, to give you the authority so that you can go and tell the state and the federal government that we have, you know, we have the authority, give us our money, right? In order to be able to do all of that, it's the state and the federal government that require this body to give consent on parking restrictions. And so it's, you know, sure, it's a, it's a technicality that we're, there, we're voting on. I don't disagree with that. Um, but what I'm saying is it's, it is, uh, a formal thing that's in front of us, it's in front of this body that we have to take a vote on, and those parking restrictions uh, have to be um, have to have to be based on the layout, which means I, I, I guess I would want to just know like is the city engineer you know what I mean like I think I'm, I'm struggling with making my point, but the parking restrictions are based on the approved layout. This is a requirement that we need to fulfill for the state and federal government and for the, the funding that we're receiving from them to do this road. And so those parking restrictions can't just be made up out of thin air, right? Like they have to be based on the layout. And so whether or not there, there are certain hours of the day when there's parking required, when parking is allowed on, um, on the bus lane is inherent to us being able to know exactly what we're voting on here in item number four. Or are we blanket restricting parking on, on those 10 blocks altogether? So Madam Chair and Council Member Chagtai, I don't think that's it. I think that, that the resolution you're voting on today is about being able to access state aid funding and any federal funding that comes through that state aid formula and being clear about this new layout. Nothing about, the layout is very consistent with the E-Line operations. Furthermore, there is no risk of losing state or federal funding based on the operations on the street as long as the E-Line can operate in an efficient and effective way. And that's why we're going to have a data-driven model for how we look at this. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're confusing two things here about this very perfunctory resolution mm -hmm. and the operations on the street, which are by both ordinance and city council action designated to the director of public works mm -hmm. and or the city engineer. Is there a language for this resolution? Passage of resolution directing the city engineer to establish parking restrictions? Um, Madam Chair, I'm gonna to look to Ms. Bremer and to clarify. Y yes, um, Chair Koski, Council Member Chuck Tai. There is a 1995 city resolution that um, des uh, delegates the uh, authority to um, manage and operate uh, city um, streets, laning restrictions, stop signs, bus stops, parking zones that, uh, to the city engineer. There are also city ordinances as no, well. No, I, I don't think that's the question I'm asking. The question I'm asking is number four starts with passage of resolution, right? Like I'm asking where the language for said resolution that, that 
you are coming to us and asking us for passage for, like what that specific resolution stat says. Chair, Chair Kraske, Councilmember Chuck Tai, there is language for the parking resolution in your packets. Can you help me understand where? Okay, can you just clarify where in the packet? Yes, I don't have it in front of me specifically. I didn't bring the resolution language, but let's see if we can find that quickly. M Madam Chair, the, the resolution is linked in the LIMS file oh. uh, we just confirmed. Okay, perfect. Councilmember Chugtai, you're able to pull that up? Is that... Can you help me understand exactly where I would go to, okay. to that? Are you in the... I also just emailed it to the committee members. What we were looking for. Go ahead, please. Right. I'll come back. We're going to um, move on to Councilmember Payne. Questions in queue? Thank you, Chair Koski. Um, this might be down the road of getting into too many technical details, and I'm assuming some of these details aren't defined yet, and you're defining them as you're working with the data scientists at Metro Transit. But I'm curious about um, when I hear a data driven approach, my brain goes to experiment design. And when I think of experiment design, I think of baseline data and I think of control data. And then I'm assuming this is going to be quite a longitudinal study. So I'm thinking about what that study period is and how many iterations of that study period there might be. First question is, is that sounding approximately correct in terms of some of the parameters around how that data driven approach is going to be structured? Madam Chair, members of the committee, council member, yes, uh, in general, you're, you're absolutely on the right track. And um, maybe two comments I want to make. One is that we want to discuss the concept that it will be a data driven approach, it will be collaborative with Metro Transit, and we clearly will report back to the council with what we're seeing, how we plan on doing it, the framework and structure of what we want to do. And some of the statistical things that you spoke to, the short answer is yes. Um, Metro Transit literally has every data point you can imagine. <laughs> you know, um, runtime, travel time, time stop, time stop at signals, time stop with the door open, time for passengers to load, and all sorts of rigorous statistical analysis on average runs, how many trips are outliers more than X minutes late, more than Y minutes late. So I, I, you know, I'm not ready to tell you today exactly what those measurements will be, but I, I'm very confident in saying we have the framework for coming up with the plan that says, how will we evaluate this corridor? How will we give it a grade? You know, is it doing well? Is it doing poorly? Is it meeting our target goals? And the data will be there. So, um, you know, short answer is there's more data than you can imagine, and we'll have opportunity to work with that. And, and like I say, we've done that on several projects with Metro Transit. Becca tells a great story. We once asked for some planning data, planning level data. Metro Transit's returned us a spreadsheet with 38,000 lines on it. So they have the data. You know, we'll work with them to come up with those measurements. And then my follow-up question for that. So it sounds to me that that operational design is not before us today as for a vote uh, based on some of the studying that Council Member Chugtai is doing with that parking restriction resolution. So there's going to be a future action that the Council will take around some of these operational details and plan design? Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I might refer that to the City Attorney. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Ping, the, um, as I discussed, the operational decisions are delegated to the Public Works Director and to the engineer, uh, city engineer, whether they are the same one and the same or not, um, by city ordinance and um, city passed resolution. So while um, the council may be uh, um, uh, apprised of those actions, um, the uh, council does not have the authority to delegate operational 
dis or to um, direct operational decisions. Are those authority boundaries defined through some sort of court precedent, or is this something that hasn't been tested in court? Uh, council member, um, the, the, um, the, the authority has been delegated by city council resolution and by various city ordinances. There are no court decisions that I am aware of that have tested this decision. So that is an but untested this, authoritative boundary, yes. As far as I am aware at this moment, yes, but it has been a historic delegation of authority that council, the city council has granted. And it should be noted that if the city council did not approve of that delegation, um, the city council would be responsible for every single stop sign, every single lane turn, every single decision that public works staff um, makes regarding traffic uh, operations on a daily basis. And so that delegation was made years ago in, um, in acknowledgement of how um, difficult it would be for city council to do, make those decisions without that expert expertise. That's really helpful context, thank you. Um, so with that kind of authority boundary driven <laughs> established by the attorney's office, um, I'd be very much interested in um, learning more about that operational design and how we're thinking about that data-driven approach. And I would strongly urge establishing our baseline when we're having that data-driven approach to have a 24-hour dedicated lane and then baseline from there do our experimental studies to see what would the impact be of opening up the lane rather than an inverse approach of starting with a non-24-hour bus lane and then doing our experimental design working towards 24 hours. So that would just be my suggestion if I were sitting at the planning table along with the rest of the engineers. All right, now we have Councilmember Vita. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks for this presentation, I appreciate it. Um, just a couple quick questions. Uh, Council Member Payne kind of talked about it a little bit, but I'm wondering more about um, the collection of data for these routes because we know that the workplace has changed. People are staying home, you know, working from home more and getting delivery services from restaurants instead of driving out to get them or taking the bus to get them to get, you know, just certain things. Like, I get my groceries delivered, but it's because I don't like the grocery store. So, like, you know, I'm just wondering if those things are taken into account with these Metro Transit studies. I know you're going to check on ridership and see what times these trips are made. And so that's one part of the question. The other part is I have a concern, an environmental concern, if we start at 24 hours and we have a bus running just say like from midnight to 6 a.m. with no one on it, right? Like how, how do they check, do they like just immediately stop running the bus route if they know that there's been three months with no one being on the bus overnight? Because the buses don't like not run. If they're scheduled to run, they're going to go the whole route, right? Like every day, the time they're supposed to be there, no matter how many buses it's supposed to be. Maybe I'll start just because I feel like you've taken all the questions. Um, thank you for the question, Chair Kosky and Councilmember Vita. Um, first, it's kind of thinking about the Hennepin Avenue corridor and deliveries and other things and changing traffic patterns. I mean, that is part of the reason why we're asking for flexibility today because of like the transitions that are happening with those very same items that you mentioned. And you know, really, it's an attempt for us to be nimble. Um, we have worked with businesses on drop-off zones during the pandemic. We understand how many deliveries are occurring on the corridor. There are a lot of things to balance as we look at how the curbside is used. Um, and even speaking to future initiatives by Public Works, the curbside management policy is something that staff will be undertaking this year. And that will be really critical as we look at corridors that have similar characteristics to Hennepin um, in terms of just all of these different competing needs that happen at that curb. Um, in terms of Metro Transit, um, Metro Transit, 
does, as, as Alan was mentioning, there's so much information, and I know Metro Transit staff is here, but I'll just kind of jump in and, and swing here, and then Alan, if there's a question, or if you want to add any more content, but they do constantly monitor their ridership. Um, you know, they do quarterly reviews, they cut service in some locations if there, is, there aren't passengers and riders, they expand, you know, their service in other areas, and it's just such a robust reporting mechanism that they have. Um, and so Metro Transit does make adjustments as needed. Um, you know, currently, obviously, the, the routes along the corridor and throughout the city have been adjusted as a result of the pandemic and just travel patterns overall. But the idea really is, is that with this BRT line, right, that we'll be running on Hennepin, that's the strongest ridership that they've had on other B BRT lines comparatively to LRT lines, even comparatively to the local routes that are serving the area. So we do expect strong ridership. That will certainly be a factor um, to your question, too, about metrics, analytics, there's so many things, but we're obviously not going to evaluate everything. We'll be really strategic about the different elements that we include in that monitoring plan as we look at how to expand those those hours beyond uh, whatever the opening day hours are determined to be. Okay. So from what we know now about buses in this area, is there anything that supports that as of now we need 24-hour bus lanes? That's, that's a hard question in terms of 24-7 operations right in this moment. The bus isn't running for the full 24 hours. It does have some hours off, similar to how the light rail operations have been scaled back. Um, I don't want to speak exactly to the timing and, and where that is. I'm not exactly sure where Metro Transit is on and where they stop and where they pick out and, and you know, what their, the, the, you know, what the separation is between the, the, the buses coming. Is it 10 minutes? Is it 15 minutes? I'm not sure exactly how that changes, but obviously, you know, in the key and the core hours, the, the buses are coming more frequently along the corridor, right? And they will continue to do that with the integration of the E-Line. Um, as ridership drops throughout the day and later into the evening, the service hours obviously expand a bit. Um, so I'd maybe just close there. I don't want to commit too much on, on what's happening right now in terms of 24-7 operations. Again, they're not running the buses the entire 24 hours on the corridor. So sure, there's, there's hours that would be available in which that lane wouldn't necessarily be needed for dedicated transit service. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Wanzi Wardleba. Thank you, Chair Koski, and we'd we'll love to get a moment to connect with uh, Councilmember Vita off hours. Um, my office is a huge proponent of the Green New Deal, and there's been ample amount of evidence that shows that as our society, as our cities move forward to a green and renewable future, public transportation and investment in public transportation is one of the key aspects to reaching those goals, and we're seeing that as represented in front of us. So love to chop it up about the Green New Deal and how this fits into that. So second question, um, I'm interested in the action that we can actually take today. I see there is a staff directive in front of me um, from Council Member Chuck Ty. Uh, your clarification, uh, County Attorney, I mean City Attorney Bremer, about us not being able to give, you know, legal or any type of precedence to uh, the Public Works Director around operational duties, that's very clarifying. Is there a way either we can move forward with the staff directive or make a proposal to amend the resolution to be reflective of uh, either er eliminating this dynamic uh, proposal, the dynamic hours that replaces the full-time hours? Because um, I think all of us are here with the same goal of saying we want 24-7 bus lanes. I think that's been clear. Metro Transit is on board. The state is on board. With local government, it's very hard often, as you noted, to get so many agencies on board. And we're finally there. <laughs> we are here. So I think for us, we just want to assure the public, we want to assure our constituents, many of those who are here today, that that is going to be prioritized in this project um, from day one. So if there's any way in which we can get concrete feedback on, on the actions we can take to affirm that in this moment, in this Committee, that would be great. So, so Madam Chair, oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> Real quick, I just want to clarify that uh, Councilmember Wanzi, we're about we will be taking up the staff direction next. Real, Real quick, we will be taking up the staff direction next. So I want to make sure that we finish this, getting through this motion first, and then we absolutely will be moving on to the next item um, in the agenda. So. Director. So, Madam Chair, I think that to clarify that Public Works is 100% supportive of success of the E-Line and getting to all-day bus service as quickly as possible, all-day dedicated bus service as quickly as possible. 
I want to be clear, the bus runs when Metro Transit programs the bus, which is basically about to 1 a.m., uh, and then there's a gap till about 6 a.m. in the morning on the E-Line right now planned. I read the E-Line study last week again. And so that said, I think it would be best, your question is not really directed to Ms. Hughes or Mr. Klugman about how best to give advice to public works. I think it's best to maybe Mr. Wilcox or Ms. Bremer about what could be done. But we are, I think to Chair Kosky's point, really we're on the item of layout right now. And I understand how they're integral to the discussion that you're having, but the item of layout is 100% receptive and able to take the all day dedicated bus lane. It has a dedicated bikeway. It has a pedestrian facility that is going to be better and much safer than what it was. And the vehicle traffic is also to our Vision Zero plan going to be uh, in terms of reducing both vehicle crashes and crashes with human beings. And so that's the layout piece first. And I think if you, the advice would be best directed, the question about advice is best directed to the city attorney's staff. Okay, thank you. And I see Council Member Chug Tai. I appreciate you speaking out, but we do not have a public comment period for for this right now. We, we have all went against whatever the data they are bringing. We all went against this project, not because we are against the bus. In 24 hours, uh, they want to put the bus lane. They, are, they want to take our parking spot. They want to put the green bus. They want to put the red bus platform. We are against those. We are not against the bus or bike. I think you... I, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you being here, but we don't have a public comment period for this right now. So where, Thank where you. Should we go? Where, who's going to hear us? You guys, the attorneys line up for a Madam who Chair. Who is going to speak to us? <laughs> Madam Chair, I appreciate this is not a public hearing, and I, I, I hear these comments that are being made. I think that's one of the reasons that staff had suggested. Uh, and we'll be implementing a parking task force as part of the implementation process, both in terms of the construction period as well as after, to hear more finely and to work with businesses because that is a piece of the feedback that we have had in that period that Ms. Hughes had up on the screen. You saw the comments go from like a small bar four years ago, and this is normal in a construction project, any type, but particularly anything that deals with transportation, and then the comments increase. And so we understand at Public Works that there needs to be more formal engagement with the business community, with users along the corridor, uh, whether they are residents, business owners, or those who are frequently using the corridor. Thank you, Director. And I just want to make a reminder that this Public Works Committee is not open for public comment at this time. Um, so this will serve as a general warning to individuals that interfere with this uh, committee. And um, so if you would like to remain here in Council Chambers, please do not interfere. We have Councilmember Chuck Tai. Uh, thank you, Chair Koski. Um, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, r remind um, our colleagues and and for folks who are watching along both here in person um, and virtually that um, our Public Works uh, Department conducted um, I think nearly sixty different community engagement and feedback events uh, over the last. Uh, Four years, and uh, we've received something like 10,000 comments uh, that have been um, that staff have gone through. Each of our offices has received what hundreds, um, nearing over thousands at this point. Um, 
emails, uh, phone calls, um, letters, postcards, um, and and those um, those have been accounted for. Uh, but with that, um, I actually want to direct this question to Ms. Bremer and Mr. Wilcox. Um, so looking at uh, the, the resolution specifically, so six item, uh, item number six, item number four within that, um, I am wondering, so, you know, it's uh, this one, this resolution um, specifically addresses the state aid rule and establishes these very convoluted no parking times. Um, and I understand that the engineer who drafted this up is, is not here today and so um, perhaps can't speak to, to this, but I guess I'm wondering if you can help me understand over here we have these very complicated and odd no parking anytime rules. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, I see that um, at, our, 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 um, at our April 21st, meeting of the Public Works Committee, which was then approved by uh, the council on April 28th, um, an item regarding the Upper Harbor Terminal public infrastructure parking restrictions. Again, a very similar type of resolution, you know, very technical in its, in its nature, um, which directs the city engineer to establish those same type of parking restrictions that we're talking about here um, on, on Dowling Avenue North between uh, the limits of Lindale Avenue and Washington Avenue um, to provide access and circulation. And so this one, on the other hand, is very simple, right? Um, it talks about the municipal state aid funds, talks about the Upper Harbor Terminal sites. And then in in the, uh, it, it just very um, plainly uh, tells us that the city of Minneapolis shall ban parking of motor vehicles on Dowling Avenue from Lindale Avenue to Washington Avenue. I wonder if you can just help us understand why we couldn't under, cause it's again, the state aid requirement, why we are not having, why we're not looking at a resolution on this item today in front of us that very simply tells us, uh, the same type of thing on, on, on Hennepin Avenue. Chair Kofsky, Council Member Tuktai, um, thank you for your question. Um, I cannot speak to why the city engineer um, wrote the resolution in this case as um, he or she did um, to restrict only in certain areas um, par parking zones. However, I want to note that the, the issue of parking restrictions is um, very different than um, bus lanes and um, that sort of um, issue. The, the city council has technically reserved the right to establish no parking zones, although it has delegated that authority to the city engineer in the past, um, including um, city engineer um, authority to um, designate disabled parking, for example. Um, but there's nothing preventing a council, uh, the, 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 nothing prevented the council member in that case to direct the city engineer in his or her own authority to establish the parking res restrictions in an area. Um, there is a difference between doing that and, and restricting completely in use. Understood. So if, if I'm, if I'm uh, just because this is an item that's in front of us today and will be again in front of us, uh, like this specific resolution will be in front of us again in, in a week, uh, for the full body to look at, um, okay, can, can we, uh, amend the, the resolution to go from this very complicated, I'm like, I'm so, it's like westerly side of Hennepin Avenue South beginning at the southerly curb of 25 and a half street west and extending northern just is you and I can't make sense of it right like none of us can we're not that we, we have no idea what this actually means and so is there something that would stop this body from amending this resolution and clarifying it so that we and members of the public could clearly understand it where we are 
restricting parking in a more clarified manner. And Madam Chair, may I help? Yep. That's I exactly. think that one of the options is to pull this resolution so that when the city engineer is back from his vacation, he may talk us through why it's written in this manner. And we can also pull in people from the Department of Transportation, the state aid office, to help understand why under the state aid rule there needs to be this, re this particular restriction. That sounds great. I, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I think I just want to understand why these specific restrictions, I, I don't have further questions on why we have to go through this process. That, that is fine. Um, is, is that a formal motion, Councilmember Chuktai, to pull this part of the amendment? Yes. Do I have a second? I, just to be clear, we are pulling, I just want to be clear with everybody, uh -huh. we are currently pulling sub item number four. Yep. Off. This is your motion, correct? Yeah. So to, to be clear then, in this case, I want to move to pull sub item four, which is the passage of resolution directing city engineer to establish parking restrictions on Hennepin Avenue South out of item number six, because I, I do still wanna move forward with uh, layout approval um, and the two other technical pieces that are included here. We're gonna pull sub item number four um, and bring it back uh, presumably two weeks from now when this, the, the, the person who, with the technical expertise on this has, has returned. Madam Chair. Councilmember Chuck, I don't know if it's going to come back in two weeks. I want to be clear. He will be back next week. He can talk us through the particular technicalities of why this is needed. We don't need this resolution to move layout into engineering at this point. Yeah, so I think that's, that's exactly why we're pulling it, right? Because we still want to approve that layout. Madam Chair, I just want to, and Councilmember Chuck, I want to be clear that it may not return in just two weeks. It may take some period of time for our clarification, especially if we include uh, attorneys from MnDOT or anywhere else to understand the state aid portion of why this is needed. Uh, I wanna just go back to my earlier comments on, on I, I don't know that I am seeking any type of clarification on why this is a, a requirement from from the state what i'm seeking clarification on is why we can uh, you know, i'm i'm trying to clarify this resolution to be more universally understood in the same way that the arbor harbor terminal resolution from a couple of weeks ago clearly restricted parking in a in a manner that made sense I okay. think I think Ms. Bremer would like to speak before you vote on this. Go ahead, Council, uh, Chair Goski, Council Member Chuck. I, I think that the difference in that situation was that the city engineer um, recommended the uh, layout in the Upper Harbor Terminal um, uh, parking restrictions. So it came from PW staff recommendations, study of that area, um, and and an thorough analysis of the traffic. Here, um, this resolution in a similar way comes from the study in those four years of work on this project. And so instead of it being a request from Public Works that the, um, that the staff, um, based on staff recommendations, it would be coming from City Council to direct staff on what to do. Um, and that that's a very different situation. No, I think we're just, wait, that's, that's not what, I'm not saying that we're gonna hold this resolution back and then counts, so a council member is gonna author it. I think we're seeking clarification on exactly what the implications of this current resolution that's in front of us, uh, six, I, item number six, sub item number four, actually means, and that none of us in this room actually know that 
And so we're going to wait for that specific individual to return to be able to explain this to us, potentially make some changes and come back. But it would still be initiated um, with, with, with staff, you know. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a second. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Councilmember Wanzawella. Thank you, Chair Koski. Um, just another uh, clarifying question to our city attorney. So the city council that approved Nicollet Mall in three different decades were also under the impression that they approve a no autos, you know, street. So based off of what you're, the advice that you're giving in this moment, are you suggesting that that was simply an issue of operations? And, and in that case, can the mayor or the public works leadership director reverse unilaterally and allow auto traffic on Nicolette Mall right now, based off of the advice that you're giving? Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, council members, um, Nicolette Mall is a unique case in which there's actually a state statute that uh, sets the procedures by which you have to establish pedestrian walking malls. Uh, and that state statute provides very specific guidance to cities if they want to establish a, uh, a walking mall. And of course, that's what the ordinances did with respect to Nicolette Mall. Um, as we're talking about this uh, design and operation plan specifically, um, the, the aspect of restricting parking uh, that is necessary for the state and federal funding is much different than uh, going beyond what is required. Uh, when, when you go beyond what is required, you are then getting into the operational um, discretion of the director of public works. And, and that, I think, is the, the disconnect there. Can I have a follow-up to that one, too. Can you explain then Marquette in second as well? Is that, was that project also under the guise of the state statute? And are you able to, after this, like share that state statute with council members? Uh, council member, um, Madam Chair, council members, yes, I can absolutely share the state statute with respect to the pedestrian walking malls. Marquette in second, I, I don't have that information right off the top of my head, um, but uh, after the meeting, I'll definitely share the state statute with respect to walking malls. Okay, not seeing any further discussion, I'll move approval of Council Member Chugtai's motion to pull sub item number four for uh, discussion at a later time. Okay, I'm getting some clarification two weeks from now. I apologize, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we're gonna pull this sub item and, and bring it back to this committee for review at our next regularly scheduled meeting. And I think that the director said that that may not be possible and so Madam Chair, can I just make one clarification? We do, from the clerk's perspective, we do need a date certain that it will come back. The committee can always continue to postpone the item. Just because it's on that agenda doesn't mean you have to deal with it at that time, but the committee could continue to postpone it. And then I will also note, because of the Memorial Day holiday, the next regular meeting of this body is three weeks from today, which is June 9th. Madam Chair, in an effort to assist, let's set it for June 9th, it may need to be delayed further depending on the information that we have. Okay. I just wanna be very clear with everyone that this you know, was in a packet and there are now questions about it and so we're pulling the motion by the council is to pull it and that's fine, but we also may need some time to gather further information since the level of questions has to do with the legal authority with the MnDOT state aid rule. I know that you feel that you know that state aid rule. I, even <laughs> though I was the MnDOT commissioner, do not feel that I fully understand that particular state I'm aid I'm so rule. sorry. I did not mean to make no, any okay. claims that no, I understood no, the state no, aid rule. I'm just saying just that, that I didn't want, I didn't need further clarification at this time. Okay, well, I will move for approval of polling sub item number four uh, and to bring back for discussion at our June 9th 2022 meeting. Um, I will uh, ask uh, for for all those in favor, say aye. 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 For those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and this will be moved. Thank you so much. Um, all right, back to the original discussion item number six. Uh, I just want to make sure that there are not any further discussion from this time period. 
Um, so seeing no further discussion, I'll move approval of the layout easements, repealing and associated one-way street and parking restrictions. And I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley Warloba. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Chugtai. Aye. Sarkowski. Aye. There are five ayes. This item carries and will be forwarded on to our next council meeting for final action. Uh, I know uh, Director Anderson Keller wanted a, a moment here to uh, just to briefly uh, just say a few words. We know that this is uh, Becca Hughes' last meeting with us, so I just wanted to say thank you and our deepest gratitude for the work that you have, have done here. So. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, I want to do two things today. Uh, first, uh, remind people that this is Public Works Week and that uh, one of the things that I think is important for the public to know about Public Works Week, I was uh, not about me, but about what our crews do every single day. So I was out uh, with Director Kraft, who's here in the audience today, Angie Kraft, and we were visiting with folks who are going out to repair your sewers this morning. Uh, they were going out to pave streets this morning. They were also going out to do street repairs this morning. We went up to Northeast Minneapolis and visited with crews who are going out to collect your garbage this morning. And so the public works, uh, what makes the city work is critical about public works. It is so important. And so I just wanna urge uh, everyone here and members of the public to thank a public works worker. They have often, I think, felt a little, um, uh, uh, maybe underappreciated recently and so appreciating them just saying thank you waving waving your hand uh all fingers up uh would be really really wonderful and um i only joke about that because uh it is the case that there is a lot of hostility and so i think realizing that people come to work to fix your sewer every day that come to work to make sure you have clean water to drink and to make sure that we are doing the very best we can on repairing our streets and roads. Um, and I do want to thank Ms. Hughes. Um, today, well, not today, but very soon, um, Ms. Hughes uh, has been a wonderful public service to the city of Minneapolis. She is a veteran of uh, community planning and economic development for many years before we attracted her over. Uh, to transportation and to public works department and has done an outstanding job. She is moving on to a new chapter of her life. She's certainly not ready to retire. Uh, and uh, we, we are very sad uh, to see her go at public works. She is a professional with every single uh, meaning of that in terms of the good work she's done. And I have to say, one of the very first things I did is I watched Becca and Alan do one of those online public hearings. And whatever my thoughts were about this project, they, they had me totally hooked uh, from there on out, both in how they worked with the public through that public hearing, but also through their thoughtfulness. And I think, Councilman Chagtai, you mentioned caring. And so I just want to say, Thank you again, Becca. I know we don't always get to do this, but I, I think this is a moment to say thank you very much for all of your work. Councilmember Vita, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Chair Koski. I just wanted to thank Director Anderson Kelleher and her team for the wonderful tour that they put together this week for myself and the Ward 4 team. There were some other um, uh, staff there also of the Eureka facility, the recycling facility, and also our facility in North Minneapolis. We got to witness um, refrigerators and furniture being taken apart and being disposed of. We had a nice view of a very flooded river. The river was extremely high 
in that area. Um, we also, the, the best thing was we got to see how much pride folks take in their, take in their jobs in um, the city of Minneapolis. We watched a study of garbage. It was so cool that people are just randomly having their garbage cans taken and there are people who uh, work for the city that are going through the garbage and sorting it out and figuring out what we're doing with our trash, if we're getting it right, if we need a little bit of help. So that was pretty fun. And I just wanted to say happy Public Works Week and thank you all so much for that wonderful educational tour earlier this week. Thank you. All right, now we have Council Member Chug Tai has a staff direction she'd like to bring forward. Uh, Council Member, would you please uh, present that staff direction? Happy to. Um, I believe that all members of this committee um, and our attorneys, our public works director and leadership team and our clerks um, have a copy of this resolution. There's a publicly available version of uh, the resolution that's uh, sitting right over there next to our clerks if um, if you're interested in grabbing a copy. Um, we have a lot more people in the room than, than copies, so I'll start with uh, just reading the resolution and then telling us a little bit about the how and the why. Uh, so this is um, on PD PWI item number six, the Hennepin Avenue South Reconstruction Project Layout Approval and um, uh, Staff Direction. So Chugtai moves to direct public works staff to work with Metro Transit to, um, one, ensure the $40 million appropriation for this, from the state of Minnesota for the Metro E-Line arterial bus rapid transit is fully utilized. In line with re the request um, of the Minnesota Minneapolis Legislative Delegation and the Minnesota House Transportation Finance and Policy Committee Chair Frank Hornstein, Public Works shall ensure the bus lanes in the Hennepin Avenue South Reconstruction Project layout are full-time dedicated 24-7 um, lanes when the street opens following construction. And then the secondary part of this, uh, you know, to Alan's point earlier, um, the 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 staff uh, at Public Works wanting to take that community engagement work incredibly seriously um, in, in working to find those very specific parking solutions because in the years of uh, community engagement that we've done in the short months that I've been here, each block um, that I go to on Hennepin Avenue of these 10 blocks and each business owner that I have met that has just a very specific vantage point of Hennepin Avenue has a different perspective to share. And so do the you know 10,000 residents that live along this corridor. So the secondary part of, of this resolution, or sorry, this staff direction addresses um, forming an area parking management task force that includes city staff, uh, commercial, which include business and landlord and residential stakeholders. The task force shall identify strategies and locations for implementing curb active curb side management and parking strategies along and adjacent to the Hennepin Avenue corridor between Douglas Avenue and Lake Street. Staff shall report back to the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee within one year on their progress. The department should have a goal of implementing active curbside management and parking strategies prior to the beginning of street construction in 2024. Um, the second part of this uh, staff direction is language that came directly from the, the public works team. I think there was maybe like one minor edit made. I can't even remember what it was. Um, but the first part of the staff direction was, um, was altered uh, to, to account for, I think, a couple of incredibly important things. Um, so I think that, um, I think that you know, I think we're going to go back and forth on dynamic 24 seven, uh, what that means and the impact of that on parking, um, on, on businesses, on, you know, whether who has authority to decide that. Um, but at the center of all of this, um, at the center of, of street layout and, um, of how we build and when we build and who we build it for are the, the very real lives of a lot of people who we have the opportunity uh, to make better, right? This is a street we're designing for the next 60 years. It's gonna outlast almost all of us. And that's a responsibility we're making to the, and a commitment that we're making to people who are going to come after us and take what we've built and, and carry it on and move it forward. Um, 
the importance of these bus lanes, uh, again, I've heard so much from, from, and guilty of this myself, from all of my colleagues on what the implication of this is, but, but I, I really believe that buses and 24-7 access to bus lanes um, in this reconstruction plan are the single largest tool for equity that we have. Um, we know that because the majority of, of Metro Transit riders are people of color, 55%. That 64% of, uh, of bus riders make less than $35,000 a year. That 83% of trips that, uh, that are taken through Metro Transit happen to, happen to be outside of that nine to five workday peak hour thing that we talk about very frequently, which frankly prioritizes white collar workers over working class people, that, um, that one in three black households in the city of Minneapolis don't own a car, um, that one in 10 residents um, who have a disability rely on Metro Transit services as their primary way of getting from place to place. So when we build bus lanes, when we build our streets, it's not just about the data and the numbers and what we call it and what we don't. It's about non-recreational users and whether they're going to benefit. It's about undocumented families who this state and this country has punished for so long that they cannot access driver's licenses and risk deportation every time they may choose to get in a car. And so our transit system has to be built so that they can get from place to place too, just as much as anybody else can. That our buses are built for children who go to school and who go to our parks after school. It's for workers who start their shift at three o'clock in the morning or happen to work clopens like I used to for years. That means you close the 9 p.m. shift and go home and then you gotta be back by five o'clock in the morning. Our bus system has to work for those people too. That it's for parents who are riding from work to get to their child's daycare facility so they can pick them up on time. It's for patients who are going to hospitals just two days ago. Um, we ran into somebody who was getting on the bus who was clearly in the middle of a medical emergency and said to uh, the bus driver, hey, I don't have any money, but I need to go to the hospital right now. Can you help me? Um, and our bus drivers, who happen to be um, union, union members, ATU, um, always step up for our communities and, and expanding that service day to day is critical for us building for the future that we need now, right? And again, when we are, we're talking about a street that's not going to open for another four years from now. And when we start talking about, oh, maybe it'll be another two years, another four years until we can get to 24 seven, we're talking about 2030. That's unacceptable. Our undocumented communities, our children, our working class residents can't wait that long. And so with all of that being said, I'm excited to bring this staff direction forward and I'm ready to take questions from my colleagues. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I have Council Member Vita. Thank you, Chair Koski. I just had a quick question for Council Member Chuck Ty. You know, I know that this, um, that Hennepin Avenue South falls in between Ward 7 and 10, and I've talked to you about this, but I haven't been able to talk to the council member in Ward 7. Just wanted to know if you had consulted with her, and where is she at on this, and was she a part of uh, the creation of this amendment since you both share you know, this space? Um, I So as you know, Council Member Vita, uh, Council Member Goodman has been um, has has been out of the office uh, w due to a, a family emergency and actually just returned late last evening, um, and so that's the the first point. And and our public work staff can attest to this that um, our council member Goodman and I have a different perspective on what the future of the street should look like. That perspective has been made very, very clear by her, and it's been very clearly understood by our staff too. Um, and so, you know, this layout comes forward without her support in the first place, right? And, and that's just the reality of, of where we are right now, right? It, it's the reality that, that 
we have disagreements about what the future of this street should look like. And that doesn't, that actually isn't a reflection on the work our staff have done. That isn't a reflection on the city policy. That actually isn't a reflection of the incredible leadership we've seen from our director as she's come into a brand new role and gotten, and brought this forward to us. It's not a reflection of me or the 10,000 residents who um, live along this corridor. A lot of us have disagreements about what, what the future of this corridor should look like. That's a no, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I put myself in queue. I first actually have a question for Director Kelleher. I am wondering if Public Works staff uh, supports this staff direction by Council Member Chokdai. So Madam Chair and Council Members, we do not support this staff direction. We, because of the discussion you heard earlier, by the city attorney's office, we have a very grave concern about the direction of operations on the streetway. It is the case that the second part of this resolution, which is something we intend to do, was drafted by the public works staff, and we did work on a different portion of this that would have been where uh, council member Chug Tai has put in the part about other units of government directing our work as well, which I think is a bit of a concern here. Um, so we at this time cannot support this. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I believe I heard that there was a representative from Metro Transit here and I was just wondering, I had a couple questions if they wouldn't mind. Madam Chair, that is Katie Roth and uh, Ms. Roth will come to the podium. Thank you, Ms. Roth, I appreciate you being here. Um, I am aware that last year Metro Transit sent a letter to Public Works uh, supporting the 24 seven bus lanes and that uh, late last week, Metro Transit sent a new letter to Public Works in support of dynamic bus lanes as a mechanism to transition to 24-7 bus lanes. Can you speak to that most recent letter? Madam Chair, Council Members, um, good afternoon. My name is Katie Roth. I am the Director of Arterial Bus Rapid Transit at Metro Transit. Uh, I do have in front of me the letter that we delivered to Public Works um, late last week. Um, following discussion with staff regarding the dynamic, dynamically operated bus lanes that are um, being discussed today. I will state that throughout the process, we have um, been very supportive, certainly, of the um, first two options for the layout of Hennepin Avenue, both of which included bus lanes, as well as um, for the preferred layout that was carried forward this winter um, into the more recent community engagement phase. Um, following the discussion with city staff regarding dynamically operated bus lanes, um, we are supportive of continuing to work with staff to establish an operational framework both for this corridor and for other corridors in the city where we are making significant investments in transit speed and reliability. Um, we wish to do so in a way that supports both peak and off-peak transit operations because we see that that is a a huge portion of the riders that we've continued to carry across the pandemic and a large portion of the increases in ridership that we do see when we make investments in transit speed and reliability. Um, so with that, you know, I will just note that um, we are committed to continuing to work with the city um, to arrive at the appropriate operational strategy. And um, as has been noted today, there are uh, approximately three and a half, four years between now and when we expect this street to be open following the reconstruction and the 2025 opening of the Metro E-Line. Thank you. So um, just to confirm, so if we proceed with a operational plan, which included dynamic bus lanes as a means to transition to 24 seven bus lanes, can you confirm that it is still Metro Transit's intention to transition to those 24 seven bus lanes? and that the dynamic bus lanes would not be permanent. I'm sorry, could you restate that question, please? Sure. So if we were to proceed with the operational plan that was discussed today, uh, which included dynamic bus lanes uh, as a means to transition to 24-7 bus lanes, 
Can you confirm that it is still Metro Transit's intention to transition to 24-7 bus lanes and that the dynamic bus lanes will not be permanent? Um, Madam Chair, Council members, we at this point um, have requested that the city not take action on specific hours of operation and that we spend the intervening seasons between now and construction of the corridor and operations to really arrive at that best approach for opening day of the Hennepin Avenue reconstruction and the Metro E-Line, as well as into the future. Thank you, I appreciate it. And then Mad I Madam Chair, can I state for the record that it is the intention of the Public Works Department of the City of Minneapolis to fully support the E-Line transition to all day full-time bus lanes as quickly as possible. Also working with the community to establish these new parking areas that need to be established to have a successful community effort here to both support business, which these are small businesses largely, they are community-owned businesses, and then to also support the folks who are going to be the customers of the E-Line to have the most reliable, fast, and efficient service possible and to maximize this investment. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Um, and then I just have one question for the city attorney, too. Um, can you give your perspective on the staff directive? And are there uh, any issues with the way that the staff direction is written as it is right now. Thank you, uh, Chair Kosky. Um, the staff directive right now does not um, align with the uh, the legal parameters that past city council resolutions and city ordinances have uh, 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 outlined um, in that it directs uh, public works to ensure certain lane operations, um, which is outside of the scope of city council. So the second part of the staff direction is appropriate and legally appropriate, but the, um, the second sentence of the first paragraph is where we draw some problems. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Chug Tai. And so um, speak up, as you can hear, there is a <laughs> storm of some sorts uh, mm -hmm. brewing here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just just on the on the shall and shore uh, piece, you know, again, I I wanna just go back to Councilmember Payne's question from earlier today, which, which uh, you clarified for us that um, the, the delegation of that responsibility entirely to our city engineer and our, um, and our public works director is one that is, has, has actually, to, to your knowledge, has never been tested in court. Um, and so that's, that's certainly, um, that's certainly a perspective I'm, I'm willing to hear. I guess I'm, I'm just not fully sure uh, where an arbitrary piece on this is coming from. But I actually wanna go back to the question that you asked uh, of, of uh, Metro Transit earlier, uh, Council or Chair Kosky. Um, and I think there was just something that was like slightly misconstrued about this letter that Metro Transit sent to us, which was sent to or what, uh, that Metro Transit sent to Public Works, which was sent to council members this morning by our Public Works director. Um, I think using the word support feels like a little bit of, a, of um, an exaggeration of what the letter actually says. It, 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 the letter, it, does, it doesn't support or endorse the dynamic lanes, but gives some, it makes some requests of the city should we choose to move forward with dynamic lanes. The specific language written over here is, should the city advance dynamic lanes, we request that the hours of operation be defined in the future following joint development of a framework for operations, including transit speed and reliability goals tied to operational performance measures that will be used to determine changes of, in hours of operation for the bus lanes, as well as a plan for enforcement. So it, it doesn't say like, 
we think you should do that. It says like, well, if that's what you choose to do, then here are some things we need from you in order to make this work. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify that, that point. Um, thank you. Thank you. I see Councilmember Wanzi Warlava. Yes, um, thank you, Chair Koski. I think I will, will be supporting this resolution one until our city attorneys can also give us um, some legal precedents as to why we were able to make similar decisions um, when it comes to, for instance, market is set. Second, I would feel comfortable if we have state statutes that have preempted this type of action before to have that information prior to um, basically not moving forward with this resolution. So I look forward to getting that information from our city attorney specifically both on uh, Nicolette Mall and Marquette in second. Um, second, I would like to know either through our Metro uh, Met Council uh, folks or even uh, MAC, uh, I'm interested, you know, the original plan has always said, you know, full day 24 seven. What specific pinpoints um, or uh, that made the shift for us to now use this language of dynamic uh, busing? So, and I think Council Member Chuck Ty highlighted that in the timeline. You, we just got this letter this morning. Where was the shift between December, where we were always in an agreement? Again, all these intergovernmental agencies of 24 7, that language was reflective in our plans to now a change to dynamic. So, Madam Chair, I think I'll try to take that. I don't think that's appropriate for Ms. Roth to have to take that question. Um, so if you remember back, and maybe Becca, you wanna put back up that public engagement graph. There, the, uh, there was another round of public engagement after last fall. And we heard from many, 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 many people again. And I think it is fair to say that on the side of concern, and you know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of concerns, but I have been fairly clear. We are supportive and thank you for your support of the dedicated bike path. Uh, thank you for your support of the increased pedestrian facility safety on this, the two-way traffic, the median, all those things. We are supportive of those things. There are people who actually are against some of those things, folks. I mean, you know that, you've heard those people. What I think the bigger concern was, was hearing uh, the thing that rose to the top in that large bar of comments was a parking concern, particularly by these small businesses. Many of them women in BIPOC owned businesses who are concerned about being able to serve their customers. And so that's where, and it was made clear to me there is actually no place, and I know that we will be probably still the first, even if we get there uh, in two years or three years, we will be the first place to have full-time dedicated bus lanes in the Metro Transit system. Other than places where on the highway, there is, oh, it is on a timer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, the slideshow's on a timer for those of you watching. So we just took it down again. Um, the, I think the important part here, Council Member Wansley Warlaba, is that uh, Metro Transit actually uses dynamic lanes in every other arterial BRT. This is a 14 mile section or line and this is 1.4 miles of it. We wanna make sure it's successful working together, having data-driven metrics with Metro Transit. And that's how that discussion came about. We have almost a monthly meeting about this with Metro Transit discussing how to both work through operations and implementation of, of, of a arterial BRT line. We do that actually on every single line that's being built right now. So just clarification, thank you, Mac. Um, I absolutely understand that, you know, Metro, count, uh, Metro have used dynamic lanes. I think what I noted is in the its original plan, the language that was agreed upon was around full-time dedicated lanes. And I think you're noting that there has always been this, this openness or practice for maybe those things to shift. I'm just 
staying in the ground of we started with that being a shared priority. Also, when you come back to us to present on the resolution, um, you know, we saw the, the slide up here while that showed, you know, the overall like kind of comment or public engagement, it doesn't present very clearly what you're sh sharing with us, the, the qual qualifiable data where parking was highlighted. Um, so if there's a way for staff to also be able to present that to us, to the public as well, that shows that 10,000 comment period or whatever the, the quantity was for last fall, where that particular concern was raised in terms of, you know, parking and how that then transcended to, okay, we must then move forward with dynamic. Um, so that data would absolutely be helpful when you come before us again. Um, as of now, what we agreed upon in that motion was in June or even prior to then, I would love to get that information. Madam Chair, we will do our best for June, but I, I will say there are a lot of comments there. And I think Becca, has, Becca and Alan have shared with me that uh, we may need some assistance in going through and categorizing every single comment and, and presenting it. And so I'm not sure about June, but we, yeah. we can provide that. So clarification to Mac, I know we need additional time. So we don't have that data right now, basically categorized, assessed as of now, from last fall, the period you just referred to. Correct, Chair Kosky, uh, Council Member Warla. Um, it, it, that is true. Um, it, you know, and part of the reason was is that yes, we, we certainly have the capability to break down and actually provide an exact percentage. But really, what we were trying to stay away um, from actually categorizing it was, frankly, not to have a popularity contest. What we were really trying to do, and I meant, I mean that more in the veins of like, fundamentally, the layout that we were looking to propose. Mm -hmm. Again, this was all about starting with the foundation of policy and doing all that technical analysis to support the layout and then also utilizing that public feedback as a means of making adjustments or tweaks in the overall layout. But if you're looking for an actual quantitative number, that's certainly something we can provide. We've, we, we've got spreadsheets and spreadsheets of information, but it was purposely not broken down into a certain percentage of winners and losers when we were looking at this. I think that would be helpful for me, especially since Mac just noted that one of the reasons why, or decision-making factors as to why we're moving with Dynamic was the feedback that came from the public engagement last fall. So I assume that that information had been categorized to, to get to that conclusion. Um, but yes, we'll love to see that data to make sure, you know, Mac, if this is the, the key factor contributing to the decision to move to dynamic, that the data backs it up too. So yes, I know that's gonna take time from research myself. Data is hard to work with, especially with y'all. Y'all doing stuff with bricks and that's just not my, not my ministry. But yes, I would love to see that. <laughs> And just for clarification, too, there are huge volumes of comments about the parking. It's, it's not like this was an arbitrary, well, you know, we had 200 people that said that they were upset about parking removal. I mean, there's, there's, it, it, is, it is fairly weighted in terms of, of, of where we're at with this. Um, and again, we can certainly provide you with a breakdown if that's just more for informational purposes. But it wasn't because it was 51% of the threshold of people. It was like, it was enough of a concern from a major stakeholder group along a corridor to try and make adjustments in the interim. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Koski. Uh, this question may be for Director Anderson Kelleher or for, for the person who's here from Metro Transit. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, Council Member Chuck Tai talked earlier about the language in the letter, and I was just wondering if should you use was maybe in there because of local control? So Madam Chair uh, and Councilmember Vita, the Metro, Metro Transit and Metropolitan Council is very sensitive to the issue of partnership and local control and operations on the streets of local communities. I think we're seeing that play out on another ABRT line right now where a community is rejecting, uh, and it's going to cut off, frankly, seven miles of an ABRT line. And so I believe that the reason, and Ms. Roth can clarify this, uh, the reason that you see that language is a respect out of local control. It's also the reason legislators wrote you a letter and didn't pass a law mm -hmm. telling you what to do. And I think that we, we do need to think about that as we move forward about the independence of Minneapolis 
to have their own uh, ordinances, laws, and rules versus being told what to do by others. Madam Chair, Council Member, um, just to add to that, I, I will just note that the language of should the city advance recognizes that the city makes decisions about how lanes are designated on city streets. Metro Transit operates buses on those streets. Metro Transit also, with our growing program of bus rapid transit lines, invests in capital improvements on those streets in partnership with the city, with the county, with MnDOT, in order to make transit work better and make it faster and more reliable. And so this letter acknowledges our role is to operate within the street that the city is bringing forward through today's action and the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So seeing no further discussion, uh, and I'm just gonna ask that given that the staff direction was given to council members less than 24 hours prior to today's public works and infrastructure committee meeting, um, and as such, the council members on the, this committee have had less than 24 hours to review the staff direction that's before us. I move that we forward the staff direction to the city council without recommendation so that it is still considered by the city council, but after council members have had adequate time to review. Madam uh, Chair, I'd like to call the question. I don't believe there was another motion in front of us. Is I'd that... like to call the question on the staff direction. Okay. So clerk, sorry, maybe you'll have to help me along here That's with the motion. process, my apologies. And then you need a second, right? Yeah. Second. Okay, so we have a motion for Councilmember Chugtai. Sorry, thank you for your patience, everybody. Um, for Councilmember Chugtai to put her staff direction uh, forward. Um, and do I have a second? Second. All right, and I will go ahead and have the clerk call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley Warloba. Aye. Council Member Vita. No. Council Member Chugtai. Aye. Council Member Koski. Nay. There are three ayes and nay. Oh, sorry, that carries. Um, and uh, with that, we have uh, concluded all business to come before the committee. And so with objection, we stand adjourned. Without objection. Without, object Without objection, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank no you. No objection. <laughs>